Hello and welcome to The Loop. Today you're joining us for the last episode in our series on generative AI. So for this final episode, we're going to be looking at some crystal balls gazing into the future and thinking about the longer term impact of this technology. Joining me today is RSM's economist, Tom Pugh, and Joel Segal, a business transformation partner here at RSM UK. So Joel and Tom, thanks for joining me today. You're welcome, Ben. Yeah, thanks for having me. So uh, should we dive in? No Gen AI was involved in drafting this script. It goes without saying that this is a big topic, lots of unknowns, lots of debate, which we've talked about in the previous three episodes. Um, and Tom, we can already feel the impact AI has today, but can you give us a feel as an economist of what it might look like 30 years down the line, you know, and how AI is relevant on a global economic scale? I think the first thing to say, as humans really, have this tendency to really overestimate the impact that new technologies are going to have in the short term and kind of dramatically underestimate the productivity gains that will accrue in the longer term and when we're talking about you know over the next 20 30 years we're very much talking over the longer term so there will be the the standard stuff that we've been talking about productivity boost to professions like lawyers and accountants and that kind of thing but there's gonna be these productivity gains for all sorts of things that we just can't even imagine and i think that's going to be the major impact it's this AI will become part of everything that happens in the economy. And that's going to lead to a huge increase in productivity compared to where we are today. There will be questions around whether you know, the gains of that productivity accrue to society more generally or whether they accrue to a select group of companies or individuals, that kind of thing. But I think it's it's inevitable that the productivity gains over the next 20, 30 years are going to be massive. So are you are you saying that actually some of the lethargy and some of the anti-climax people are feeling today is like a false trap and that they should be prepared for something really, really fundamental? Yeah, I, I think fundamentally think about it as there's two kind of stages. There's, I guess, the installation stage and that's kind of what we're going through at the minute. It's kind of people working out how to use this, what is it, how does it, fit in this business or that business what's the best way of using it and that it just takes quite a long time to work all that through you know these are we're still talking about significant investments in capital in people in processes you know and we're still a long way off affecting the technology so there's this long ramp with this installation phase and the productivity gains during this phase are going to be pretty low because there's a there's a kind of a cost to changing the way you do business once we get off that on ramp and, and kind of onto the ai motorway then that's when we'll really see the productivity gains kind of kicking in and that is the longer term so that 10 20 30 year kind of period what's your take joel on ai and where we're going to be in 30 years i think tom is definitely on the right motorway uh, so to speak um i think I, I like to sort of look a bit back and forward at the same time because I think history is useful when we get a technology that comes along that, in this case, I think our American colleagues have described it as sort of a renaissance moment. The problem is the renaissance lasted quite a while, and I think GAI, if distinct from AI, is a similar sort of journey. So I think we can absolutely see where it could apply and I do agree with Tom that it's definitely in the sort of um, professional services, very paper-based, heavy, crunching sort of areas where there's large language involved, text, formatting, those things. I think the challenge comes to it's a trade-off between what the human was doing and what we're now asking the technology to do for us. So it really what we've got to wait for is the, is the point where humans allow GAI and trust it to do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. So I did a lot in law for three years, and I can see it really helped create a first draft of certain contracts. If they were simple, if they were difficult, it didn't do such a good job. And so lawyers were less likely to trust what it could produce. And I think what they've got to then do with it is to say, okay, I'm allowing it to take on 20, 30, 40% of what I do today, but if I don't take that 30, 40% and do something else with it, then I think it doesn't deliver the value. And I, 
generally, if I step back from that and I look forward, I think we are entering the wisdom age or the knowledge age where we, as humans, can't just read stuff and regurgitate it. We have to create that so what, the value, the insight. And I think GAI gives us this opportunity to say, okay, let me remove the drudgery and free up. But the human has to then take that opportunity and say, I'm going to use that time to create foresight, insight. I'm going to look to the future. I'm going to refine my draft to a level where I really believe if I'm a lawyer that I've got a contract that is better than if I had spent all my time just trying to get a draft out. And that is the conundrum. It just takes longer than we always think. Yeah. I mean, it, we're taking 30 years because it's a point of future, but we could be talking 20, 30, 50, couldn't we? No one can really put a pin on it. But Joel, you talk about lawyers there as a good example. And like, just because um, we're not lawyers, account it myself, we'll kind of take a step back. You're talking about the power of the technology around first draft. But is there a future where um, these technologies progress to a point where we're replaced fundamentally and that actually what we look like today doesn't exist? I mean, I think if we go back to law and I think people have spoken about it, is, is there a need for a lawyer when you have an NDA, a very simple document? Is, is there a future where machine to machine can agree these things? If you go back on AI and Alan Turin, who was the father of AI, you know, we talked about the cognitive power and some of these other elements that would come into it. I think I can see a place where as we start to get the machine to machine to work, so let's get the ecosystem to ecosystem to really wire up and get things done, I think we can see that productivity gain. And I think we can see if there's an event that is triggered, the AI literally takes over and does it for us and we are allowed to potentially override under certain circumstances. Whereas today we think about work in a very different way. We think about, oh, okay, I've got to engage in that. I've got to speak to someone. I've got to produce something. And I think in the future as we move forward, work will look different. It will happen differently. GAI, it will be more between business to business, whereas a lot of what we've seen today is business to consumer. And some of those shifts, I think, will move our economy, will deliver productivity. And it's, you know, we're UK, we're a service economy, we're financial services. This is where we need to put our focus and our time. You use the word productivity quite a lot. And actually, Tom, as an economist, what do we mean? You know, we talked about productivity. What does that mean as an economist? The simplest way of thinking is just how much you produce per hour. How many legal documents do you draft? How many counts can you do? You know, all of this kind of stuff per hour. And when you think about the economy in its kind of most basic sense, your economy is how many people have you got working and how much does each person produce? That's really kind of what it is. And, well, if we look at the demographic trends for the UK, but not just the UK, you know, you pick a country, really. And we know that the demographic changes we're going through mean population growth, working age population growth, especially, is going to be a fraction over the next couple of decades of what it has been over the, over the previous few decades. So we know that having more people working is going to be very difficult. So if we want any sort of economic growth over the next couple of decades, well, it's going to have to come from improved productivity. So that's one thing. And really, productivity is so important because that's where we get a boost in our living standards from. Economic growth, fine, it, it is good for a country. But as individuals, the only way that we gain more, that we you know, can increase our purchasing power, our value, is by becoming more productive. And you know, that is something, especially in the UK, that we've really struggled with over the past 10, 15 years or so. And you know, AI is you know, one of those technologies where you can really see it having a, a huge beneficial um, impact on productivity. Do we need it then? You mentioned the way society will change and age profiles. And actually, are we talking about it just because it's a convenient answer to an economic problem? Oh, I mean, it is a, it is a convenient yes. answer. And I think there is a degree of saying, you know, we don't need to worry about the changing demographics and the cost of pensions and all of this kind of stuff because AI is going to make us all super productive and we're going to have to worry far more about how we um, distribute the gains from AI that, you know, this is all doom mongering and don't worry about it. AI is going to sort everything. There is definitely a, a school of thought along that kind of thing. And I think maybe that will be true in the 30, 40, 
fifty year horizon, but we've got to get there first. There's a, going to be a lot of kind of issues that we have to work out in the next five, ten, twenty years before we see these kind of huge improvements in productivity and, and living standards that AI pro can promise. Yeah, I mean, Joel, you think in the short term, what's holding this up? What's getting in the way of Gen AI kind of solving everything tomorrow? Well, I think in business sense, what we're really talking about is capacity is the metric, right? So it's about how do we free up the capacity of humans to get through things so they can get to, well, as an economist, higher value services. So the bit that's getting in the way is we've got a number of people, the human side, I always talk about the human alongside the machine. I think the humans are still resistant. The number of humans who are doing more drudgery and heavy lifting, this is seen as a threat to maybe livelihood and work. And partly that's a human fear about, well, what would I do if something comes along and takes away half my work if you don't back yourself to be able to do the more high value adding service? And so I think the bit that gets in the way a bit is we also embrace it, but we don't do enough of is, okay, well, how do we train and educate our people? Not to necessarily just use it, but more to think about what are those tasks and activities they should be working on and who of our population has got those capabilities to move and shift into those higher valuing services and what happens to those who can't? I mean, but where do you start with an emerging technology? Like when you're talking about training and educating people and uh, we've seen some of the universities in the United Kingdom kind of come together and say that we're going to overhaul our syllabus to increase more awareness of data and AI, which is useful. You know, what sort of things in businesses do we do when we, we're, we're faced with something which could change everything in 30 or 40 years? But as we sit here today, we're still unpicking. Well, I think there's two sides. I, and it goes back to a, a, a a book that was written a few years ago by Noah Harari, one of these sort of, um, I think he's more of a futurist uh, called Homer Deus. He, he originally wrote a book called Sapiens, which is the history of man. And then he wrote a, a bit like your question, Ben, a question on, well, what's, you know, where does this take us? And it focused quite a lot around um, what might that journey look like. And, and, and I actually penned a, an additional um, LinkedIn article on the back of that, but, but a few years later on what are the skills that humans actually will need and he'd originally had four C's because when he wrote it, he didn't know about GAI. And actually having worked with it, I've, I've realized you also need to think about cohabitation. Which the companies that win is the human and the machine. Those that have got both will be more successful because there are lots of things where judgment and wisdom come in. So the skill sets and things that you've got to start thinking about if we're organizations, you know, today our syllabus is very focused on parrot learning, I call it regurgitating things. Now look at my son doing his Latin revision for his GCSEs. It's extremely painful. He's basically having to regurgitate and learn lots of Latin prose and then do a translation. I'm thinking, honestly, that is a really good one for Copilot, um, Microsoft's uh, product. So the future, we don't want young Joel's son coming in. What we want is the person who can say, oh, I'm gonna, I will instruct Copilot to produce me somewhere and then I will do something valuable. So I need that critical thinking with it. I need people who can communicate exceptionally well and read people. I won't go into all of them, but there are there are a number of different areas where I think we need to look and say, what are the things that the machine will most likely not be able to do as well as a human? And those are the skills that we really need to cherish and focus on. Yeah, and I, I think this goes on to, you know, one of the big fears that you always hear with AI, Gen AI, is that there's going to be mass unemployment. You know, it's going to just replace millions of people across the workforce. Um, and what you always find with these kind of new technologies is that over time, they create more demand than they save. So you always have kind of growing employment, growing economies, but that doesn't mean that there won't be some pain in the transition process. And that's entirely because some skills are going to become redundant. So the people who are not willing or not able to change, adapt, upskill will find themselves with their skills at least becoming redundant. Whereas those who can upskill are willing to learn what is now needed in this kind of new gen AI economy 
will find themselves becoming more and more productive and have higher and higher living standards. Let's come around to people. This is our fourth podcast on Genesis AI. Every single one we've touched on workforce and people. So, you know, Joel, I kind of touched on your thought leadership. You've mentioned it there. And you talked around the five C's, which I've listed off here. Creativity, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and cohabitation. I thought that was really interesting. Um, I suppose my question is, I'm struck by the absence of compute or computing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and coding. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what's made you think about those five as opposed to, you know, coding and computing, which might lead into what we're ultimately talking about here is software. So I think there's a good point. Actually, I've read a few things on it. So I think the two things are happening. One is people actually using GAI to code. There are really good no-code um, software available today. Mm. So if you are a, a critical thinker and you can draw a process flow of what you want the logic to do, the software today will generate you the code. You do not need to learn Python or something else. Mm. Secondly, if you code, you can send it to it and it will convert it into very nicely structured code and it can do it like that very 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 quickly so i i don't say that people shouldn't be coders but actually what they've learned is at schools if people learn chemistry or biology or other things actually the ability to conceptualize different structures to be able to break things down into different structures and put them together again that is synonymous with being able to put together programs and logical flows so those are skills that i think humans need to have and develop actual production of the code and writing the thing and talking to it actually the machine should do and we should let the machine do more of that Mm -hmm. as we move forward we need to focus on those high value thinking processes yeah so what you're talking about my read is these are human skills that the machine or the tool the software can't duplicate correct but can give the perception of duplicating we talked about this in a previous podcast when you have generative artificial intelligence art is a piece of art created by someone using generative ai of equal artistic merit to someone using a paintbrush and paint so you're entering this kind of slightly more complex world so so i think that's a really good one because my hobby is photography Mm. so i've played with adobe and used adobe all the time what you see is actually yes you can ask um one of the gai products to produce you an image of x combined with y and it'll look through and put something together and you don't know quite what you're going to get to as a human you have infinite choices to think actually i'm trying to blend these two different things together and actually you can start to combine it so you can start to say actually i'm going to do some clever masking here i'm going to mask out joel's face i'm going to put a very handsome picture of tom's face so i want a man with a beard and a nicer haircut so these are the choices so I, again i come back to that's the kind of cohabited model of where we work together is where I think we'll find real creativity and also be able to nuance it and create things that actually also sometimes apply to the emotional level. So what I find very interesting with the GI stuff is it's very flat, whether it's artistic or whether you ask for a document or you ask it to try and produce a script for you, it it lacks that emotional edge. It's not going to have the resonance and humor that the three of us have got on this podcast. But do you think people are are scared because you're talking about like creativity, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and cohabitation? These are these are hard things. These are harder than taking, you know, an Excel spreadsheet and moving one set of numbers to another. And is that partly why people are scared of gentle artificial intelligence? I got invited to sit with the head of my son's school and some parents to discuss their syllabus for the next five years course i thought it'd be a really nice test case as a budding economist not a real one like tom to just test my 4c model or 5c's or 6 or and i'm sure we'll keep adding pen as we think of other things that a human can do unique um and actually they loved it because although they're starting to touch it they hadn't really appreciated that yes there's a syllabus which is very much the parrot learning syllabus you've got to do things and you've got to get through things and you've got to you know it's a way of um, of doing things but the syllabus and the educational skills have not been upgraded. So if you looked at the education of teachers, if you looked at what they need to learn to actually be able to deliver some of these, those are not on their list. I fear our education systems today do not address those areas, and those who are teaching have not been trained to address those. Yes, they're helping on mental health. Yes, they're helping on some of the other challenges at schools, 
but are they really helping us build the breed that we need? For a, go to Tom's world, the service economy, that's going to be a growth engine for the UK and the future. No. I, I feel like there's a bit of a, it's called the sunk cost fallacy. You know, the idea that if you have spent decades learning to code perfectly, or as I did, you know, all through university, you spend months learning matrix algebra and how to do kind of regression stuff, you know, in Excel and blah, 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 and all this kind of, you spend so much time doing it. And when you've done it, you, know, you are classed as smart or that's an achievement or whatever. The idea that actually Gen AI means that was all, you didn't, that means nothing now. A computer can do that instantly. It's difficult for people to acknowledge that actually this skill that I've spent a long time building and I've you know, built up this credibility for actually is not worth now as much as it used to be. That is a hard thing for people to accept kind of psychologically. Tom, you've been traveling around the UK talking about the economy and people have been asking about AI, of course. What sorts of fears or questions are you getting around workforce from business leaders? Yeah, a lot of it is... There's the short term stuff that we talked about, about the UK economy, especially is suffering from labor shortages. We know that that's probably not going to go away for the next couple of years. There's the long term demographic challenges. There's a lot of appetite for how business leaders can address these labor shortages, either by upskilling their current employees to, to be able to make better use of AI in their jobs or how they can automate more processes so they just can expand the business without hiring more people. And at the minute, this is very dependent on what industry you're in. It's a lot easier to do this in law or accounting than it is in hospitality or construction. It'd be a long time before you get an AI haircut. Mm. So at the minute, it's still very sector dependent. And then in the longer term, you know, there's this concern that AI is going to lead to this kind of mass unemployment you mentioned word automation I'll ask you joel when people talk about automation you know generative ai leads to better automation do people saying that lack ambition about this technology i always worry when people say automation because you sort of have this connotation of robots i think gai is less about automation i think ai can be applied in two ways one is it helps us undertake work products in a fast, structured way based on the tagging and natural language models that sit behind it um, to a degree that we can do it quicker than as a human. The second thing we realize is actually if we want to have automation, we need intelligent process. So that's the flow of a set of activities. And to make it go quicker, yes, we can apply more AI than GAI to, to have intelligent processes that make sure that things actually get routed in the most efficient and effective way. And some of that we could use a bit of GAI to have some questions and choices that might be made and based on some thresholds or research that it does very quickly. It could steer the process in a certain direction. But I actually don't think GAI for me is primarily around automation. I, I come back to what I think it's about, which is about heavy lifting of tasks that generally are very text heavy or if you want to quickly get a few visualizations, it could help you think through some things and mock up some things quickly if you use the prompter in a very smart way. But all it's trying to do is, is reduce some of the heavy lifting capacity and free you up to have more time to then apply your wisdom and insight. Let's play to our day jobs. So ben, you, know, you advise organizations on accounting challenges they might have. And you've read a lot and you've seen a lot. But really what they're hiring Ben for is your insight and your wisdom. And GAI could help you quickly gather some of the latest thinking, look at around, you know, what others have done and, and maybe give you some starters for 10 that you might want to check or just check if the code has changed or gap has moved. But ultimately, it's you, Ben, with your brain and your creativity is actually what people are going to pay their money for. And the question is, can it help automate some of the heavy lifting it can gather it and put it together. Is, is that automation? Maybe. But is it, is it really helping us speed things up? Well, it depends on how much. Does it really save the human time? Or have you just moved your time to spend it on stuff that's more insightful and valuable? 
I mean, I would build on it to say I think it can be enormously disruptive. I mean, we're talking about a technology driven by data that allows you to create new content, well, noble content. You know, and I'll give a working example. Um, I can't play the flute, but I could use gentle artificial intelligence to create music. And maybe there's something inside me that makes me be able to create great flute music. Now, almost certainly not, because um, I'd like to think that if I really want to play the flute, I would have picked it up and had a go. But you have this sort of, this ability of this technology to kind of break down barriers and change walls. And I suppose that looking out 30 years, I just, it's very hard to sit here today, isn't it, and visualize what those changes might be. It's like saying um, you're sat in a mill in the late 18th century and someone says to you, oh, did you know we don't need to use a water um, mill to power this anymore? You can buy the steam engine and change it. And then you think about how those mills were reconfigured around steam. Nobody sat there today realized the potential of that technology. No one understood at the time how powerful the printing press would be right at the start. So that's, to me, where we're sat with this. But there are challenges today. So this is where I think if we're looking kind of 30 years ahead, the really transformational stuff I think is going to come from not necessarily general, but more AI more broadly being used as a tool to generate other technologies. So if we're ever going to crack fusion power, if we're ever going to crack properly self-driving cars, if we're ever going to cure cancer, if we're ever going to get to Mars, these things are going to be done by using AI tools to help us do it. And they're the things that if you think 30 years down the line, will make our economies and our, our societies radically different from where we are today. But to your point, I suppose, playing on it, but not disagreeing, is that I think it's not a single technology. Because I'd actually, I could also say it's, what are the skills we're going to need to develop and deploy to actually curate our data and get it structured and get it normalized and get it organized so that we can leverage it? How are we going to string different databases and different insight modules together to get us more robust outputs? How, how are we going to do comparative analysis on different sources? Potentially some GAI, potentially it's some data, potentially it's some AI to predict and give us views of where we worry about things. Um, it could also be around the flow, it can be around intelligent automation, um, and it's also going to be around how the human then uses that information uh, in the right ways. Um, we need to think about the talent that, that makes up people. Like what are the skills, the people, you know, the kind of roles that they're going to play? Um, but then what we really need to think about is the how are people going to harness um, the data and the digital power? And that's what we get a bit confused here because GAI is... The, the technology that's separate to the data. So we need to make sure we've got those two things very clear. And then we need to look at the human and say, well, what is the wisdom or the knowledge or the insight they put across that that creates something that is more valuable than just allowing the machine to run as the machine or what they would have done using their own historical knowledge. So I start with always people, what is the intelligence or the insight that we think we're going to need in the future, because if we can move to some people, the knowledge economy, but if we can move to a more insightful way of working, we can think about value versus process effort and capacity. I think we move the dial to what we have always been talking about for the last 30 years about what will the knowledge age, we call it digital age, but what is the knowledge age all going to be about? And how far can man go without his digital twin? And that's really where Alan Turing more than 30 years ago, started thinking about, okay, where is this going to take us? How far can the machine go? Can it really start to capture our cognitive abilities? You know, that's the scary stuff because that's when we cross into <laughs> in cyborg <laughs> territory. But now, yeah, some people are worrying how it might be used by crime organizations and others to do things and deep fakes and other stuff. But actually, it's the cognitive abilities that we worry about. Can the machine start to really use the way we think, the way we do things, and put together ways of manipulating us? We start to see some of that, but I think some of that stuff is the things that you can either use in a positive way in the future, or it could be used as a negative way. Are you, to summarize, are you saying that we're, it's very difficult to project what insight is going to be valuable in the future? Um, to use myself as an example, a lot of the things I do today insight into accounting standards, generative AI will be able to provide similar. But what you're saying is um, 
a good way to look at it today is think about what is inherently human, what is inherently a machine good at, and that's a good starting point to look forward 30 years, or at least as good as anything. Correct. So I'm saying exactly that. And actually with clients, we talk about what we call evolutionary science or capability-led strategy. It's the same as evolution. So look at nature, look at how it evolves and it survives. Humans, organizations are analogous to that. We have to adopt a capability-led strategy. And all we're talking about is, oh, here comes GAI. That was really exciting. Didn't see that one coming at this speed. It's come along. It's given us a bit of shock. But there will be other things that we can see out beyond GAI, other technologies that are also coming down the track. And actually, how are those going to help the machine evolve? And all I'm saying is, boy, let's not just focus on the machine. Let's also think about the human and how do we create and improve and create the best humans. I come back to my point, cohabitation, which is how do we help those humans build the cohabited skills where they realize to be successful, they have to rely on the machine in ways that you and I and Tom never had to. We were far more reliant on our own abilities. Tom, do you have any closing thoughts? Yeah, just revisiting this initial, you know, to bring it full circle, this initial point that we tend to just dramatically overestimate what these new technologies can do in the short term. And people will get a bit disheartened when actually in a year or 18 months time, the whole economy hasn't transformed and we're not all on universal basic income. And at the same time, dramatically underestimating the value change, the change in productivity, the change in our societies that will come from these technologies over, a, over the kind of 20, 30, 40 year horizon. So I think this is why this podcast has been really useful, because I think that horizon is where we're going to see the dramatic change in our economies and our societies, not just in the UK, but globally. Great. Well, Joel, Tom, thanks so much for joining me today for the discussion. If anyone would like to hear more from Joel or Tom, please do visit the RSM UK website for more of our thought leadership on this area and others. And indeed, you can find all three of us on LinkedIn. Um, thank you for listening in today. This is the last in our series of Genitive AI podcasts, but please do look out for more episodes of The Loop.